أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم and peace be with you all welcome to the Sharia intelligence course I am your host Muhammad Nuruddin Lemu and with me to discuss today's topic are two of our top facilitators in this course brother Nasir Bello and sister Salatu Suleh السلام عليكم and you are welcome today inshallah we will be doing a recap or part of a recap of some of what we have discussed over the last couple of episodes looking at the tools of usul al-fiqh we will be focusing on the last three tools that we discussed what have been described as the istidlal the reason based tools uh, but which also serve as safety nets we will discuss more about this but these tools have generally been associated with the protection of the spirit of sharia the spirit of the quran and sunnah we will be looking at their role in the protection of the maqasid of sharia the higher intents and objectives of sharia but also the extent to which other tools other sources of law plays a, play the same function i'd like to start by asking brother nasir by way of recap why are these three in particular Uh, Masali al-Mursala, Istihsan, and Saddu Zariya. Why have they been described by some as serving a role like a safety net? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, to begin with, uh, safety net as a principle actually was borrowed from the game of uh, acrobats or trapeze. What they usually do is... Um, because the game is highly risky uh they have what they call safety net such that when in the event of accident when they fall down they have something to give them protection as they do their own games and therefore the principle of protection actually was borrowed into the processes of ijtihad the tools of istidlal then are used using that philosophy of protection what do we have to have that will help the mujtahid in the ijtihad process to protect the spirit of Quran and Sunnah as mujtahid does his ijtihad. So they are just like a, a quality control mechanism that guide the processes of ijtihad that ensure that what, whenever a mujtahid is, is conducting his ijtihad, the outcome of the ijtihad does not really contradict The, the spirit of Quran and Sunnah, or what we call the objective of Sharia. And this is jihad, uh, these tools of istidlal, the rationalistic tools, are essentially focusing on protecting the maqasid of Sharia, that is the spirit of the law, essentially. Now, uh, these tools of istidlal, or what we call the safety net principles and tools, are three. We have the masalihul mursala, we have the istihsan, and we have the Saddu Dhariya. Now, if you look at the Istihsan and how it relates to the idea of being a safety net, if Istihsan by its nature, it is a tool that has only one and only one function, and that is the realization of Maqasid, achieving Maqasid. And therefore, by design, the tool of Istihsan has empowered the mujtahid to devise whatever way effectively possible to get to the objective, to achieve the objective. It is just like somebody who is traveling, uh, trying to catch up a plane in the airport, and suddenly he actually was caught up by a traffic jam. His car cannot move, but he realized that if he changed the means of transportation, maybe he used a motorcycle, or what in Nigeria we call kekena pep, or probably bicycle. or bicycle. <laughs> probably he can navigate through and catch up with his flight. Otherwise, he is going to miss the flight. So as a mujtahid whose objective is to get to the airport and not to miss his flight, then you will see him changing a tool that will get him there. So uh, the idea of istihsan is if the tool I am using Uh, could not get me to the destination. If you get what we call ijtihad jam, just like a traffic jam, then the need for you to change a tool that will actually allow you to navigate through. It is just like uh, experimentation. 
where you keep trying, you know what outcome you are envisaging, you are targeting to achieve. So you keep trying this method. If it didn't work, immediately you switch to another method. Or um, uh, the adjustable spanner, where you keep adjusting until it's able to discharge the, response, the, the task or the role you are trying to, to, to address. So basically, this is the idea of safety net as it relates to the important tool of istihisad. This is very interesting, and I like the idea of how just as you can have a traffic jam on your way to an airport to catch a flight, you can have an ijtihad jam where in the ijtihad of the scholar, he or she is not able to realize the maqasid with the existing tools. They'll need to change tools, and this is what istihsan does uh, to ensure that uh, decisions are always maqasid friendly, that they are always in line with the maqasid. Sister Salah, what would you add to this? So the daria is another of those istidlal tools or methodologies which also acts as a safety net. When we just, you know, take a few steps back and look again at what we mean by Swadu Daria, it's the situation where the jurist, in the course of um, carrying out ijtihad, realizes that based on the circumstance that is before him, the context, if he is to proceed by applying the existing principle or existing ruling, there would be harm created. In other words, something that is ordinarily halal, based on an existing ruling, would lead to harm. So the daria blocking the means is where the jurist then makes a ruling that prohibits that action, that thing that would otherwise cause harm on the other side. By being harm sensitive, by um, having strong sensor for checking, is there harm going to occur? So the daria therefore keeps safe that particular um, aspect of the Makosudu Sharia, which is about Darul Mafsada, preventing harm. The third istidlal to Maslaha, which is basically the concern of the jurist for public interest and welfare. So the jurist seeks to do those things that will ensure that the interest of the general public, of the common, um, that the common good will be preserved. Again, that ties back to the Makosidu Sharia, the accruing of benefits, as well as the prevention of harm. By acting, um, using these two, two, these, either of these two tools, the jurist then ensures that however he or she may navigate and carry out ijtihad, whatever considerations they may bring to bear, whichever text they may be looking at or the context they may be looking at, that any errors they might make would not be such as would lead to harm or which would prevent the accruing of benefit. So one who may say that the safety net principles are like the Makasid insurance or Makasid assurance tools within Usulul Fiqh yes, um, that ensure either um, benefit is protected mm-hmm. uh, or harm is stopped yeah. or prevented from happening. Um, how else would you explain the relationship between these three and all the maqasid or the objectives of Sharia? I know you've touched these in various ways, but what else would you add? Um, I would add the fact that when we look at the three, I like to call them the big three, when you look at them, you see that what they are doing actually is highlighting, underscoring, um, keeping the focus on the Makosid, even though the field where they usually operate, where they operate is Usul al So they maintain that focus on the Makosid of Sharia within the field of Usul al Well, I think uh, it has been established the objective of Sharia is about accruing benefit and preventing harm. Mm-hmm. And therefore, within the context of the objective of Sharia, and having uh, mentioned that these tools of istidlal are there to protect the maqasid of sharia, which is accruing benefit and preventing harm, what you find is, in terms of preventing harm, usually scholars use either of istihsan or saddudhariya. While in the event of accruing benefit, you would find them using either 
maslaha or istihsan that is why in the previous discussion we've been talking about how, how hanafi school has been in, insisting that istihsan is enough for them and as you can see in in either side istihsan has been very useful for them uh, as against what obtains in the maliki school where if they want to prevent harm they use do the ria if they want to accrue talk about accruing benefit and public interest they use uh, maslaha so what maliki and the i think the hanbali school who distinguish between maslaha um, or masali al mursala istihsan and saddu zariya basically they are just breaking down what the hanafis all call istihsan Absolutely. and just for the sake of more careful study of each otherwise you could treat them all as one adjustable spanner um, and as you've uh, indicated they seem to be the key tools in usul al fiqh that focus specifically on protecting the spirit of Sharia. So while others are more tied to the letter, to legal presumption, etc., there is a major concern here for enjoining right, uh, accruing benefit, preventing harm, and giving the jurist the power to ensure that whatever changes in the context, that ijtihad is always sensitive to problem solving and gives the most efficient uh, solution. The element of istidlal tools that deals with the concern for the spirit of the law, to what extent can we find the other tools being concerned about the spirit of the law? Is it only these three that are concerned about protecting the spirit? Um, or are the other primary and secondary sources also concerned in some way with protecting the spirit of the law? I think um, the ultimate objective of all these tools and sources of Sharia is tied to the spirit or protecting the spirit of the Quran and Sunnah or of Sharia uh, as a whole. If you look at the Quran, the role of the Quran as a divine uh, truth is about guidance and wisdom. Uh, it is the most reliable source of Sharia because it is what actually forms Aqidah. It is what gives, what serves as the source of the things we call Ma'alum min ad bid darura. And if you come to the Sunnah or what we call the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it represents the same feature like the Quran, only that is coming from through Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Of course, when it comes to hadith, you begin to talk about the separation of mutawatir and ahad, particularly when you come to discuss about certainty. Now, the next tool is ijma. Ijma is about separity in numbers. It's about uh, found fundamentals or foundations of the religion. And it's about unity of the ummah, which is also part of the objective or the spirit of, or the maqas, of, the maqa, of maqasit. The next tool is Qiyas. Qiyas is about hikmah, it's about wisdom, it's about the reason, uh, trying to rationalize and understand the reason and the wisdom behind the text, behind the revelation, that is the Quran and Sunnah. And the next tool is Amal. Amal is so much like Ijma. And another interesting thing about Amal is the role it plays in trying to differentiate applied Sunnah and what, what, what they call not non-shari'i sunnah within the first two generations uh, of the Medinan society or the Muslim society. Now, uh, we also have istishab. Istishab is about justice, it's about fairness, it's about freedom, it's about, uh, it's about convenience, it's about ease, it's about responsibility. So if you look at them, all these tools that we are talking about, somehow they are tied to the ultimate objective of protecting the spirit of Sharia. This is very interesting. The idea that studying the text is actually the, the purpose of studying is to get the wisdom. The purpose of studying is to get to the spirit. Uh, that the text is actually the carrier of the message. And the purpose of scholarship is to actually get to the hakiki. What exactly is the lawgiver um, trying to communicate? And how do we make sure we protect that under varying circumstances? And as you've mentioned, 
uh, in all the principles and sources that you have touched on so far, we find each one of them having a concern for a particular segment or element of the spirit of the law. Uh, Salah, what would you add to this? Yeah, um, I would like to add that there are some of the other secondary tools that we can also trace their connection with the preservation or the protection of those Makosidu Sharia. Let's um, take a tool such as the Rai'i Asahabi, the opinion of companions. As we would recall when we covered this aspect, we said the companions were people who witnessed the life of the Prophet wasallam. They heard from him directly, they learned from him directly, they were corrected by him on occasion, they were empowered by him on occasion to do this or that. He described some of them in very um, glowing terms when it comes to what they were able to um, do, their knowledge, their ability to understand and practice the deen. Therefore, whenever we say, okay, the companions have or had, this companion had an opinion on this, and it's an opinion that the jurists consider one that could form the basis of law, it was often because it was believed that that opinion was not coming about because the companion just felt like it that the companion was passing on the wisdom of the sunnah or the companion by choosing to act or speak that way was trying his best or her best to represent what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam exemplified and what he taught them for that reason when we then say okay so what was the aim what was the primary objective of um, the mission of the prophet peace be upon him it was to bring benefit Allah said that he did not send the prophet except as a mercy to the world. So it was also to bring benefit and to prevent harm, which is why he um, also said to us that whatever it was that he advised that we should do or said we should do, we should do. When he says stay away, stay away, because his goal is to bring mercy, to bring good. So it goes back to that accruing benefit and um, preventing harm. When we look at the Makosu de Sharia themselves, those that first, that broad expression, accrue benefit, prevent harm, we know is drawn from the Quran as well as from the Sunnah. When we look at the specific um, goals, high intent, prevention, um, protection and preservation of life, of lineage, of family, of um, wealth and all of that, all of those, each one of them is rooted in both the Quran and the Sunnah. So when the companions express something, that seems to have stemmed from the tradition, the way of the Prophet wasallam. then we can connect it still to the Makosidu Sharia. Another one would be the um, Urf. Custom is seen as a basis for um, legislation. So a Mujtahid would go by way of custom, but we know there's always that qualifier. It's not just any custom, it's beneficial custom. So right there in the qualifier of what kind of custom can form the basis for law, we find the um, maslaha embedded in it. So the benefit is embedded in the idea of what custom. Another thing about um, respect for custom is respecting the wisdom that people have accrued over time based on experience, based on thoughts, Based in many cases on trial and error, they've tried this, it didn't work, now they are trying this. So that cognitive um, capacity that Allah has given human beings, it's, a pres it's so you could call um, respect for custom a way of preserving and enhancing the intellect. Another thing about custom is when people have tried some of these things and it has worked, they then take pride in the way that they have evolved for themselves, in their manner of expressing their beliefs of how life should be lived. And we find in some cases that the custom of a people, which we could tie to Mu'amalat, actually stems from their expression of the deen, of religious beliefs as, as well. So you get a, a sense of um, identity and dignity tied there. And dignity, as we know, Hivdul Ird, protection and preservation of dignity, is one of the core um, Makosidu Sharia. A third one is um, Shar Uman Koblana. That is the laws of those who have come before us, talking about past revelation. When we um, talk about Shar Uman Koblana as a juristic tool, we are talking about those um, concepts or precepts from past revelation that we find mentioned 
in the Quran and mentioned and understood to mean it's something we should go by. Allah says in the Quran, and he mentions it in a number of places, whatever he has revealed is for our benefits. There's wisdom in it, there's good in it. In some cases, he would say certain things about past prophets, past revelations, and then say, you didn't know it before. Implying, I'm telling you now, so you know. And why would he tell us? It's for our benefit. There is always wisdom in it. He mentions how he tells these stories of past prophets and past revelations, not I'm just paraphrasing here, not for entertainment, but for instruction. There's something to learn. So what is the what are, what what is the benefits there? It's the learning, understanding. So you have protection and preservation of the intellect, of religion, of life, of whichever aspect of life you can tie any of those um, precepts to. It's very interesting, and of course the other tools which we we've already discussed. Um, Maslaha, yes. al-Mursala, Istihsan, Saddu Zariya, yeah. and their role as protecting the Maqasid. And in another way, actually, you could say protecting the Maqasid that are also articulated in the Qawaid, the legal maxims, yes. many of which uh, have been shared. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm saying the yes, yes, definitely, because they are more explicit, more direct. Whereas these other ones, it's, it's more implied. Um, yet we know there is no way th- these other tools would exist if over time juries did not implicitly know and understand that these help to preserve the Makosid. Yeah. This is wonderful. Um, and it reminds me of the popular quote from Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya, uh, a great student of Ibn Taymiyyah, a medieval jurist, who said the entirety of Sharia. Uh, the Islamic way of life, that is, is about accruing benefit in this world and in the hereafter. And that in its entirety, it's about justice, mercy, wisdom, and good or benefit. He goes on to say, any ruling that moves from justice to injustice, from mercy to its opposite, from wisdom to folly, and from goodness to harm, is a ruling that does not belong to the Sharia, even if it is claimed to be according to some interpretation. And I find that, particularly coming from a student of Ibn Taymiyyah, Mm. um, shows a a scholar who has articulated the strength of the spirit of the law, that any ijtihad, any understanding of Sharia, where that conclusion, that ruling that comes out of ijtihad goes contrary to the spirit of the Quran, of the Sunnah, and he mentions these four major ones. Justice, uh, mercy or compassion, uh, wisdom and benefit. That anything that goes contrary to these, you know, you must put the brakes on. Because he says it doesn't come to the Sharia. It doesn't come from the Sharia. You can't have rules that go contrary to the spirit and purpose of the source of where those rules come from. We'll stop there, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you so much for your wisdom and contribution. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.